you. All right. Well, good morning. It has. Uh, it's. It's been. Yeah, I got to follow him. I do this to myself too. I know. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. All right. Well, let's. Uh, let's just say a prayer just for a minute. Just a little centering prayer, if we can. As you take a deep breath. Just let go of any distractions. God, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to your heart. And may the thoughts of our minds today be focused on you. Amen. So I mentioned earlier this new Central Texas Conference. Um, it's not going to be the Central Texas Conference anymore. It is going to be a combination of the North Texas Conference, which was um, east of Grand Prairie, almost all the way to um, Texarkana um, and north, and so includes Dallas. Uh, and then our own Central Texas Conference, which extends from the Oklahoma border down to Waco and a little further, actually down to Round Rock, probably. Well, so now we're adding a third conference, a third annual conference. We're adding what used to be the West Texas Conference. And so we will now stretch from just this side of Texarkana all the way to the New Mexico border and everywhere north of Round Rock, Texas. Yes, and they, fittingly, very fittingly, the name for this new conference is the Horizon Texas Conference. Uh, because when you stand on one side, you can see, you can look and see the horizon. Anyway, I'm going to a meeting uh, at the end of this month, and the purpose of that meeting is to build bridges. As we begin to create a relationship between these three conferences, and as we begin to rebuild our reputation as United Methodists in the world, we are going to join together on that Saturday morning and we'll sing and we'll worship and we'll hear a little message from the bishop and we'll have communion together and then we will vote to be a part of each other's lives. And so I'm very excited about that because what they're doing then is they've created this operational framework for how the church is going to conduct its business, right? But then they're also going to share the vision so that we're all conducting our business and moving in the same direction. But more importantly than all of that is this turns the focus of our United Methodist Church toward this one shared vision. And I, I wrote this for you. I didn't write it here because I ran out of time, but it's printed on the other bulletin that's trapped in my computer because the printer is possessed this morning. Uh, anyway, this is the new vision for the United Methodist Church, that we are followers of Jesus, seeking the loving, just, and free world God imagines for all people. Now I want you to say that with me, all right? We are followers of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus, seeking the loving, seeking the loving, just and free world God imagines for all people. That is the new vision of the United Methodist Church. Isn't that beautiful? Just lovely. Just lovely. This is our new story, this vision. It's our new song. We should have sang Blessed Assurance this morning, Max. So we stand now in this place and we have our eyes focused on getting to that place where we're all together. And as Bishop Sign said last November, we do have a reputation to repair. There's a gap right now, though, between where we are and where we want to be. And the work of this convening conference and the work of this church is to bridge that gap, is to get us from where we are to where we want to go. Now, there are some things I want you to consider um, as we join together with our United Methodist siblings in the rest of Texas. First of all, we can't do things alone. 
part of the appeal, part of the strength of the United Methodist Church is that it is a connectional faith. We are connected not just to God, but we are connected to other churches and to other believers. But it's going to require a supernatural power to concentrate the attention of this many people on one vision. Our scripture from Romans today, in Romans 8.26, says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When we can't figure out exactly what to pray for, the Spirit of God intercedes for us in prayers. And that's kind of where we are with this new conference. Nobody knows exactly what to pray for. Uh, it's going to be a strange gathering of people. The North Texas Conference, the former conference that held Dallas, is known for being very, very liberal and very community-oriented. The Central Texas Conference was kind of a mixed bag of churches like this one and churches that left because um, the, the ideas that we had were too broad-minded uh, for them. And then the West Texas Conference lost all but seven churches. And so there are seven churches there that are... Um, have remained United Methodist. And so to get all these people on the same page, working towards the same thing, we're, we're going to have to have some help from God. The second thing I want you to know is that we can't solve all the world's problems. We can't fix them all. We've got to pick two or three and focus our attention on that. Now, we've already done some work towards that this year. Eternally, we have focused our attention and our efforts down the street to that elementary school down the street that we serve, Bill J. Elliott. We've taken socks and underwear to them so far this year. And we've got a plan soon, um, probably around the middle of October, we'll begin collecting warm coats. All right? Um, you can throw a rock if you can throw really far, but you can throw a rock. It's about three blocks this way, this elementary school. Three long blocks, but it's three blocks. It's in our neighborhood. The children who go to that school live in these houses and in this area right over here. Now this week I read a story. I actually got a text message from uh, the city of Fort Worth. Uh, not that I'm anything special, but, you know, they got my, felt my phone number somehow. So they sent me a text. It was a picture of a, one of the city councilwomen and the new mayor. Her name is Maddie. I can't remember her last name. I apologize. Parker. Maddie Parker. Thank you. Uh, somebody's paying attention. Thank you, Annette. Uh, anyway, so Maddie Parker and this councilwoman are talking about the fact that they have worked together to determine what can be done about the number of children in Fort Worth and in Tarrant County who are not reading at grade level. Now, how many of you, how many former teachers do we have in here, educators? Right? Yeah, there's a few of you, right? All right, so tell me, somebody just tell me, what happens when a child can't read at grade level? It's very hard. Life becomes very, very difficult. Very difficult. Um, it, it, there are all kinds of stigma that go with it. All kinds of mental health distress that goes with that. It's hard for the family. It's hard for the child. And so they put these statistics in this article. Uh, so in Tarrant County, 57% of children read at grade level or above. In Fort Worth proper, in our zip code, only 26% of children read at grade level or above. And our school down the street that we're working with and we're, they, that we want to be a part of their lives, 19% of those kids are reading at grade level or above. There's about 300 students over there. So only about 60 of them are able to read at grade level or above. Now, how many of you can read? At grade level. At grade, well... <laughs> 
You know, you're not supposed to lie in church. He raised his hand. I don't know how to teach a child to read. I know there's some format for it. I know how I learned. I learned because my grandmother, my great grandmother read me the same book day after day after day until I could read it to her. And once I knew those words, she brought out a harder book and we read harder books and harder books until I could read. And by sixth grade, I was reading at a 12th grade level because, because of her, because she knew. She who grew up never left, never left seventh grade. She taught me to read. We can sit with children and read to them. We can sit with children and listen to them read. And so Connie had to step out today to go. She's going to go visit Bill and Linda. Uh, but that's one thing Connie's going to talk to the counselor about, is about us helping to read. Now, it's not going to be easy, okay? You can't go and be with children without having a background check. All right, you have to give them your name. You have to give them information. We have to do this legally. We also have to create a safe space for them if we bring any of them here, all right? And so it's going to take a little work, so I want you to be prepared for that, that, uh, that inconvenient part of it, all right? But we'll get whatever books we need. We'll do whatever we can because 19% is not tolerable to me. It's just not tolerable. It doesn't cost a dime to sit at a table and listen to a child read. The things we're also doing externally from this building is we're working with the East Side Ministry to provide food and clothing to help those folks um, who, who live either without shelter or with inadequate shelter and inadequate access to food and to water. And, and Bill Parker is our board member that sits on there. Bill can't do that anymore. He can't do it right now, all right? So I'm still looking for somebody that'll go to those board meetings. There's one on the 13th, actually, this week at noon. Um, anybody at all, if you can get there to go to this board meeting, please let me know. Um, but Carlene, thank God for Carlene, has volunteered to be sure to continue to take the food and the clothing and everything we collect over to Eastside Ministry. And then another ministry that a few of us have been involved in and that I want us to expand our reach a little bit is called Under the Bridge Ministries. And this is a group, it's run by a woman whose, um, whose son was living on the streets and passed away. And so she wants every Sunday, rain or shine, 52 Sundays a year, she prepares a hot meal she and several volunteers, they load, them, they load the food up in trucks and in vans, and they literally drive down under the bridge at Lancaster and I-35. And they, saw, they line up there, and they serve 300 people meals, hot meals, good meals. At the same time, they hand out little bags with hygiene, and little bags with snacks. They give out, you know, sock. They, they just give out whatever anybody brings, they will be glad to distribute. And so I was, I was talking to Raquel about all this. I said to her, you know, I've got a church full of people who can't stand out here on Sundays and help feed. But they can sit at a table on Tuesday and Wednesday and stuff snacks into plastic bags. They could spend an hour after church on Sunday if they wanted and, and, and put hygiene products, right? Put a toothpaste and a toothbrush, feminine hygiene products. We can do all of those things. And I want us to start because they take a lot of time, Raquel and her group. It takes them <clears throat> about an hour and a half to stuff bags before they even go. And if we already had that done for them, it would save them some time and maybe they could focus their efforts someplace else. And then our last place that where we focus, where we're, we're looking outside, where we're standing here and we're looking outside in our community to help is with Blake's choir, his Booster Club choir. That's another ministry, another outreach ministry of our church. We've talked about that a few weeks ago. I still need some folks to step up. How many of you are in the band? 
in high school. Nobody's Julian. Keith, Keith was in the band. Joe, I know you were in the band, right? Yeah, how many of you were in choir? Okay. We, the Booster Club needs some members, needs some folks. One of the things it needs is a treasurer. The treasurer will be on the bank account. And I'm telling you that because I don't want you to be surprised. All right, you're going to have to go down to a bank with the president of the Booster Club. And then after that, all you have to do is deposit money from fundraisers. You don't have to run the fundraisers. You just have to deposit the money and you write checks for expenses. All right, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but, but basically that's it. And so I'm looking for somebody who can, can, can help Blake with this. You all know Blake took that choir in that, in that Title I high school in West Fort Worth. He took that choir from not doing very well to sweepstakes in less than three years. Uh, and Julian, that's his alma mater. Hey, see me after I got a job for you. <laughs> All right? All right. And so these are great things we're doing in the community, and I am so thankful for you. So thankful for you that being part of a congregation means more to you than sitting in church on Sunday and having a biscuit or a donut before you come in here. I am so grateful for that. So grateful. Internally, the church, the United Methodist Church, wants us to focus on five things. We talked about this last year. The first one is to multiply Jesus' followers, bring more people to the knowledge of the love of Jesus. You cook meals, you go visit, you do all kinds of things to help care for the congregation. Once I am retired from nursing in about 18 months, we're gonna have, we're gonna have some other things here. We're gonna have a Celebrate Recovery meeting once a week for folks living with addiction. We're gonna have some Bible studies here during the week. We're gonna do some things to really bring some care and some healing to this congregation. The fourth thing is to pursue and to embrace diversity. Now, we live in the right neighborhood. We just got to open the doors. We got to make sure everybody knows the door's open and everyone's welcome. And we do a great job about that. Um, once again, <laughs> when I am full-time in this church, we're going, to be having, we're going to be having neighborhood festivals. Get your tent ready, Brian. Hey, Brian, we're going to get Brian to import a bunch of more hot dogs from Wisconsin. We're going to feed the neighborhood, all right? We're going to open these doors on more than Sundays and let this neighborhood know that we're here. And then finally, tell our story is the fifth thing the church wants us to focus on. Now, at St. Matthew, we voted. I don't know if y'all remember, but we talked about what do we want to do? And we chose two, three, and four, champion children and youth, maximize care and healing, pursue and embrace diversity. Our number one pick was to pursue and embrace diversity. Thrills my soul. Right? Because we... If you're fighting for children and youth, and if you're focused on care and healing of congregation members and community members, and if you're pursuing and embracing diversity, you're already multiplying Jesus' followers. And you do all those things by telling our story. And so this will be an easy thing for us, but it's one of the things that, that, we are, that we chose, that we decided we would be focused on internally. And the last thing I want to talk to you about, and this, um, this has a lot to do with what's going on with, with the Parkers right now. And with a few other families that, that, you know, we don't talk about a lot, but Joyce and Dan Mitchell, who are no longer able to be here. 
Barbara Jones that we were talking about today who lives in New Braunfels, but before that, she would get into her car and drive her 93-year-old self from North Richland Hills. She'd come down the back way, come through the flats to get here and come down the back way to get to church every Sunday. And she loved this congregation. Her um, uncle was a, a United Methodist minister and she grew up in the church and is an, a, she's a historian of the Methodist faith tradition and just and talking to her is just fascinating. But she had to move where her family was and so she's not able to be here anymore. But I bring up those names and there are many others. Please, if I didn't say your name, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but those are the three families that are on my heart this morning. And so one of the other internal ministry that I want us to focus on is something called intercessory prayer. Now, intercessory prayer is you building a bridge or bridging the gap or standing in the gap for another human being with prayers to God. And these aren't just any prayers. These aren't just, Lord, bless them. Lord, give them, you know, good health. It's, it's not what this is. This is intentional, intense, focused prayer for another human being. This is taking the heartache and the illness and the distress of another human being and gathering it up in prayer and laying it at the feet of Jesus and then begging God, help them. Please help them. And I've been, play, I've been praying this week for Bill and Linda like that. And I have to tell you, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to pray. So sometimes I just close my eyes. And we learned in Roman that the Holy Spirit will step in for us and will intercede and will pray with groanings that are so deep even we can't understand them. But God knows. Well, we have a lot of folks who need intercessory prayer. We have a lot of folks too sad to pray, too sick to pray, too overwhelmed to pray, too discouraged to pray. We have people who struggle with what to say to God. I don't know what to say to God. Mary, I don't know how to pray. We have folks struggling with emotions that have turned their hearts away from God a little bit. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. In, at the end of Romans 8, says that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. God is never far from us. But there are things that happen in your life, things that happen to all of us. I had moments like this in, in, just six months ago. Standing right here in front of you, there were times where I could not feel my connection to God in my heart. And so what I want us to do is I want us to become a congregation that participates in intercessory prayer for each other. And so I brought you three names today. You can look around this room. You, there's nobody in here that you put your eyes on that couldn't use a little extra prayer. All right? So I want you to pick somebody. I want you to pick somebody. And I want you to be intentional this week, every single day. Get on your knees if you can. Yeah, I know. I, I could get on my right knee, but my left knee just won't, is not having it. If you can't get on your knees, get in a quiet place. Make it a sacred space. Light a candle. Do whatever it is you need to to put your mind focused on praying for other people. Because just like this conference can't do what it needs to without the supernatural power of the risen Christ, none of us can get through the struggles of this world alone. God is with us always. 
And the great thing about that is God's children is that we are available to build that bridge between where people are and where God wants them to be. I was listening, blessed be the tie that binds, this second verse. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't even know that I've ever sang the second verse, but, or that I, whether I was listening or not. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. That's it. That's intercessory prayer. That is pouring your ardent prayers out to God for somebody else. The song Julian sang, <laughs> when you're down and out and feeling small, and when the tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'm on your side. And so find somebody. Pick somebody. Because it won't just change their life, folks. Intercessory prayer will change your life as well. Because, folks, we're the bridge between where people are and where their relationship with Jesus Christ is restored. And I want to make sure you know that I am not saying that God ever leaves you because God never leaves you. There is never a time, there's never been a time, there never will be a time where the presence of God is not with you. But you will go through times where your own heart can't feel it. If you need a prayer, like the Holy Spirit prays, in Romans, then let's get your name on the prayer list, all right? If you don't want your name on the prayer list, you just slip me a note. Give a note to Jason. Give a note to Max. Let's begin to, to hold each other up in these kinds of prayers, all right? And change the lives of these folks who are too tired, who are too sick, who are too discouraged and too overwhelmed to pray for themselves. Now we know we know what it looks like to build a bridge for somebody else. We have the perfect example of it. We know because our Lord built a bridge for us to get back into relationship with God. Our bridge though was built on a hill called Mount Calvary. Our names were called out by Jesus. Forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. It's been done for us, and it's our turn to do it for each other. Please. This is from uh, Walter Brueggemann from the book called Prayers for a Privileged People. In your presence and in the company of your good saints, we offer you our praise and thanksgiving for life and for calling, for the joys of friendship, for the burden of faith. As we sit in the midst of your many mercies, we are mindful of so many of our brothers and sisters and siblings who dwell in places short of mercy, absent of justice, defaulted on the gifts of life. We can recite the grocery list of needful people and violent places, but you know them all. As you know them and we know them, we pledge in this company to take these needful people in these violent places as our call from you. We are so poorly equipped for such a call, but you are the God who gives bread and wine, table and towel, book and song and with them courage, freedom, and energy for the task to which we are unequal. Catch us up this day into the reality of your good purpose, God, that by the time we leave each other, we will know yet again that your mercy and justice and compassion outrun all the needs of the world. Keep us simple and on task. 
and we will praise you by our glad obedience. And all the people said, Amen.